Hi and welcome to the second lecture of Early Modern English where I'm going to talk about different uh, grammatical structures and the different syntactic aspects of Early Modern English. So I have a video here uh, that you can watch at your own pace at home. Uh, it's a video on how to talk like Shakespeare because we talked about Shakespeare in the previous video um, and so this uh, video will show you how um, actors who uh, perform Shakespeare plays in theaters across the world uh, prepare um, to, to deliver their dialogues and, you know, uh, practice how to talk like a Shakespearean character. So the main syntactic or linguistic change that happened during the early modern English is something that I've been alluding to towards you know, from the beginning of the semester, it's the Great Vowel Shift. It's called GVS, and it's something that happened around the 15th century to the middle of 16th century. Um, a Danish linguist called Otto Jespersen was the person who discovered the uh, Great Vowel Shift. And the Great Vowel Shift, like the name suggests, has to do with just the vowels. So the vowels that are involved in the Great Vowel Shift are the long stressed monotongs. So no diphthongs play a role in the Great Vowel Shift. It's only the pure vowels and it's the six long stressed pure vowels. Um, and we, we say the stressed vowels because these are the vowels in stressed positions. And these are the vowels that are pronounced with a longer duration than short vowels. So short vowels are often in unstressed positions uh, in the syllable and long vowels are in the stressed uh, position. So here is a visual um, um, aid to kind of illustrate the uh, great vowel shift. So you have a uh, bite, right? So uh, bite, so, so let's start actually from the bottom, right? So bait was, pronounced as bat, bat, right, in Middle English. And so that R changed to A, so then it become um, bait, bait, right, which then became beat, so the E, right, so beat, and then beat became bite, right, so you have the R to the A to the E to the E to the I. Right, so bait, beat, beat, bite, which is the diphthong. So it's basically how the long walls became diphthongs, right? So uh, in, on the other side, you have the boat, which was pronounced as boat, boat, which became boot or boat, boat, and then became boot, right? With the oo and the ba bot, right? With the ow, bot, ow. So here I have some of the examples of the sound changes. So the wall E as in meese would have been pronounced in Middle English as meese. And the modern word mouse uh, would have been pronounced as moose in Middle English. So basically it became maus and then became mouse, right? Which is the final diphthong that we have right now in uh, modern English. The same thing with the wall feet is considered a mid wall, so it would have been pronounced fet in Middle English. So basically the Great Wall Shift illustrates how words started becoming more like how we pronounce it today in modern English. Here are some, uh, some more examples of the sound changes. The wall O, the wall R, uh, for example. So the wall O as in do would have been pronounced as do in Middle English. And so do became do. So the wall shifted by one position. So all the words that had that wall initially in Middle English started shifting into the next level. The wall R is a low back wall. So you would have pronounced things like nam, nam, right? And then that became the diphthong A. Um, and again, the long open O uh, would have been pronounced as saw. So the modern English word so would have been pronounced as saw in Middle English. So to, just to give you a little bit of linguistic terminology to um, figure out the great vowel shift a little bit more, you have the low vowel R was fronted to the A and then it was raised to the E and then to the E. So you talk about two kinds of phonological terms with great vowel shift. First, you have a fronting of a low vowel. So the low vowel is produced at the back of the mouth and then it goes into the front position. So you have a front vowel and then it becomes raised uh, to the E 
on the earth, which uh, are not a low or front valves anymore, but they are more like the central valve. So they, they are, that's what we call by a racing uh, valve. Each of the mid valves was raised one step. So you have the E and the O becomes the E and the U, and the lower mid E and the R becomes the E and the O, right? So you have one level of raising with respect to each of these uh, mid valves as well. And then you have the high valves, which is the E and the U, and these became the diphthongs, right? So you have the I and the O uh, that, that, that the uh, high valves immediately move to. So you have three changes. You have to talk about the low valves, you have to talk about the mid valves, and then you have to talk about the high valves, right? So low becomes mid, mid becomes high, and the high becomes diphthongs. So that's really the gist of the great vowel shift. So let's come back to standardized English. Um, and I wanna talk about some of the reasons why um, standardized English became a reality in early modern English. I mean, we talked about how um, standard variety of London became the standard English compared to all the different dialects uh, that English um, had at that point. But why, why was there a standardized English and how did that come about? Well, there are a couple of reasons why it came up. One was that people started publishing dictionaries thanks to the printing press. Before this, we did not have dictionaries or we had limited um, you know, books that, that kind of showed the vocabulary of English, but nothing like a mass produced dictionary. So the first dictionary was Robert Cowdery's uh, Table Alphabetical from 1604. And then obviously Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language, which like I say, is the single most important linguistic event of the 18th century, uh, because this is really the biggest kind of culmination of um, any dictionary of any language uh, published in the world. But the other reason why there was also standardization of English was because there were a lot of grammar books that were written. And this is the era of prescriptivism. We'll come back to that a little later on um, this semester. Let's talk about a couple of changes that happened in uh, different domains in the, the language. So we'll start with the nominal domain. We'll start with the nouns. Well, this is the first time that we actually start to see the usage of regular versus irregular plural marking. We've been talking about how um, Old English, Middle English have been forming plurals, but we haven't really been talking about regularity versus irregularity, but this is the kind of period where you start seeing that. So by the end of the Middle English period, you had the ES ending, which was a plural suffix, but a lot of Different forms from Old English and Middle English actually resisted this. So um, words like geese, mice, men, oxen, children, etc., refused to have that ES attached to it. And so these were uh, classified as irregular morphology. This was also the era that saw the arrival of the his genitive. So basically you would say things like Augustus, his daughter, uh, the House of Lords, their proceedings. So this was basically the usage of his, her, their as a genitive uh, versus the apostrophe S uh, genitive. The apostrophe S genitive was also there um, at this point, but uh, you would also use these possessive pronouns in a genitive kind of format. There were two reasons for the arrival of this. The first was the use of a topic common structure, which um, existed in English as early as Old English, as you can see from the example that I have here, which is from the ninth century King Alfred's History of the World by Orosius. Uh, and here, here you can see, I'll, I'll read the translation and not the, uh, the poem in the Old English, Nile the river, her sources near the cliff, right? So you can see that the higher awilme, higher I will may her source, right, is near the cliff. So that is, it, it's called a topic and common structure um, in uh, linguistic terminology, but this is really where you can start to see this kind of a uh, his or her, their uh, kind of genitive usage as early as Old English. The second reason for the arrival was that, well, there's a lot of ambiguity between the, um, the his, uh, the pronoun, uh, the possessive pronoun and the apostrophe as genitive case marking. So you can say Tom bets a salary 
uh, it's the same thing as saying Tom Betts's salary. They are identical in pronunciation. Or, or another common example that I often use is ice cream and ice cream. So ice cream with I C E C R E A N and I, the the, the pronoun I and uh, S C R E A M, ice cream. So. These two obviously are uh, similar, just like Tom Betts' salary and Tom Betts' salary. And so this kind of cost of confusion brought about uh, his, her, their genitive. There were also other kinds of genitives. One was the group genitive, and this was where you have the genitive S added to whichever word ends a phrase. So Kim Prime of Troy's son. So King Prime of Troy is a group right? So you're not talking about Troy, you're not talking about King Prime, but King Prime of Troy. So that was considered to be a group genitive. And the group genitives apostrophe S was added to the word that ended the phrase, which was in this case, Troy. And then you also had the uninflected genitive where you you know it's a possessive noun, but you actually don't see the apostrophe S. So for God's sake, right? Um, and one of the reasons is obviously if you have God's sake, well, sir is already there in the next word, so it's kind of like redundant, so you drop the S, or ladybird, which is actually our lady's bird. And in African-American vernacular English, you very often hear things like my brother car. Um, African-American vernacular English is, is famous for dropping the genitive marker, uh, something that we'll come back to if we get into the World English's um, module at the end of the semester. Adjectival endings um, were lost, so we do not have any more weak adjectives versus strong adjectives in early modern English. We don't also have adjectival agreement, so we don't uh, have an agreement between the adje adjective that modifies the noun and the noun itself. That was lost in the early modern English period. Well, it started, we started losing it in the Middle English period, but we definitely don't have any cases of that in early modern English. And there was also um, comparison that was expressed in two different ways. So you have a synthetic comparison, um, which was still used, but analytical comparison like more and most uh, started increasing. So synthetic comparison is obviously when you have um, um, the ER, right, ending, uh, and the analytical comparison is when you have the more, the it, it, it's also called as periprastic uh, comparison. So you can say uh, prettier or more pretty, where you obviously prefer prettier to more pretty. But there are some adjectives like beautiful, where you cannot say beautifuler, but you have to say more beautiful, for example. Uh, this was also the era where you see a lot of double comparisons. So you can say things like more fitter, more better, more fairer. Shakespeare used a couple of these, for example. Um, we don't use that anymore. It's considered to be ungrammatical in English. Uh, the reason why a lot of people use double comparison in this era was for emphasis. So if you wanted to emphasize that something was really, really better, then you say more better. And there was also in early modern English, many ad adverbs that did not end in L-Y and these adverbs were called as flat adverbs. So here are some instances of personal pronouns. And uh, as I've always said, personal pronouns uh, or pronouns in general is the area of the grammar where there's a lot of intricacy and a lot of complexity. Um, and that still remains the case in early modern English. So you can see nominative, attributive, and uh, the possessive uh, forms of the pronouns in the singular, first person, second person, and third person, masculine, feminine, and neuter. I, thou, he, she, it, me, thee, him, her, it, and my or mine, thy or thine, his, her, and uh, his, it, or it. And here's the plural. We have we, you, or the ye form, they. The objective, us, you, them. Attributive, our, your, their. And the nominal form, ours, yours, and theirs. You can start to see in the early modern English uh, period the loss of the thou, the thee, the thy, the thine kind of forms. And uh, the move towards pronouns that we actually use today in modern English, uh, for example. But obviously, um, Shakespeare still wrote with a lot of these uh, older forms. So um, it, it, it's one of those things where, you know, Shakespeare is a lot more difficult to decipher because of those. And that's also why people think that there's a lot of Middle English that you have overlapping with Shakespeare's early modern English writing. 
the non-standard use, so this is something, I mean, um, I have a lot of fun when I teach this face-to-face -face in class because obviously many of you might have, you know, uh, might use a lot of these. So these are actually uh, non-standard speech, but a lot of people use it. So we say things like use, yuns, y'all, you guys, you lot, etc. cetera. Um, and I think it's generational. It's also dependent on what region you come from. Uh, so this... I hear there's a lot on campus at Wichita um, and also in other places, but I just want to tell you that singular and plural you is often distinguished by non-standard speech. This was also the time when the relative pronoun started uh, coming into use. So this is uh, the they with a thorn symbol that was replaced by the that and the which. And also you start to see uh, around the 16th century, uh, the usage of the interrogative pronoun, the who on old English, hua. Um, and so this was really the first time that you actually start to see this relative pronoun being used. Um, let's now talk about the verbal forms. Well, the regular forms of the verbs that uh, exist in early modern English were all weak forms. So you have talk, talked, and talked. And then you have the irregular forms that were either strong, sing, sang, or sung, or weak, think, thought, and thought, right? So, um, so regular forms are always weak, but irregular could be weak or could be uh, strong. It depends on the paradigm. It depends on the inflectional form. There were three endings that survived from Old English, and these were the infinitival form, like to eat, to talk, to sing, etc., and the past form, uh, which is the ed, and the past participle, which is uh, very often uh, with the en, right? So class one verbs formed its past from the Old English past singular, so you have drive, drove, driven, strive, strove, striven, etc., uh, class two form their past from the old past participle. So you have choose, chose, chosen. Class three, uh, that, that those are in um, verbs that end in nasal consonants. They retain their old English inflections. Begin, began, begun. Class four forms borrowed the vowel of the old past participle. So that's break, broke, broken. Class five forms have diverged from regular development. So you have eat, ate, and eaten. And other class five forms have become weak such as need, reap, weigh, etc. Class six shows regular development, slay, slew, slain, and several verbs of class seven shows, irregular, shows regular development, no, new, no. So here are uh, some of the verbal endings. Well, obviously, um, a lot of personal endings have been lost in uh, modern English. So you have, in the present form, you have I sit, thou sittest, he sitteth, and we sit. And in the past, we have I sat, thou sat, he sat, we sat. So you can see in the past, we kind of have something that looks a lot more um, like how you and I speak today. Uh, and at the present, there is still a little bit of the endings like the sitest and the siteth, uh, but those actually changed when, uh, for example, we stopped using the thou uh, and moved more towards the you, um, closer to the late modern English era. We also had several verbal contractions at that point, and this occurred around the 17th century. So you have won't, which is a contraction of wall and not, don't, which is do not, and ant, which is am and not. So you can start to see that a lot of contractions started uh, being used in the 17th century and not before that. So here are some verbal expansions that became uh, more common in the modern English era. You started seeing a lot more progressive forms. So you started seeing things like I am working, he's being punished, etc. cetera. Uh, verbs of motion use be instead of have. So you start saying things like he is risen, uh, he is turned white, and reflexes were frequently used. So it dislikes me, give me leave to retire myself, etc. And the last thing that I want to say is about the prepositions. Well, lots of the inflectional endings gave more importance to prepositions. So we start to see a lot more prepositional usage, like to, above, from, with, at, in, etc., because we lost a lot of inflectional endings. So that kind of information that was supplied by that inflection had to be recovered somewhere, and preposition was the way that uh, the language did it. All right, so I will see you next week when we start uh, modern English uh, or late modern English.